So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for joining the Harassus event uh, here with the United States Focus. Um, we have uh, the privilege here of having two outstanding panelists to explore with us the state of trade and the path to re-engaging or reinvigorating significant global trade. And so uh, just uh, on, on that basis, we've been asked to consider some fairly significant questions in the state of trade as it is today. Before we get into the panel, I just want to acknowledge uh, that Harassus and the organizers uh, did give us the opportunity to engage this morning with some very, very uh, courageous and brave and inspiring leaders from the Ukraine. So I wanted to just acknowledge that and, and say that it was a privilege to be able to join that session. Um, and with that, uh, allow me to then turn it over, Janta, to you for, for, for a quick introduction, then you, Raj, and then Raj, you'll lead us into the first topic of conversation, gentlemen, if that's okay. Janta, over to you, please. Yeah, good morning, Alexander. Thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks to uh, Horasis for giving us this opportunity uh, for meeting after, after, I think, five, six months again. Uh, I am Jayanto. You know, I'm a professional turned entrepreneur. Uh, having more than uh, two decades of uh, professional experience. Then I uh, become an entrepreneur, started of my own. Currently, I am associate with uh, uh, a startup, which uh, we, within four years' time becomes a unicorn. And uh, we are uh, now uh, creating a new supply chain. So for us, you know, building material industry is concerned in India, which is uh, to a large extent, unorganized. We are we are trying to make it organized. Uh, uh, so far as India is concerned, so far so good. We are going in great guns. Uh, our uh, uh, you know valuation of the company from last year one billion to now we are talking about a four billion valuation. So and and we are looking for uh, going public in next two years' time. So you know that's my small introduction. Thanks, Alexander. That, that is very modestly put when you call it a small introduction, John. So thank you, and thank you for joining us. Raj, over to you, please. Well, well, it's a pleasure and an honor and, and quite humbling to be here with you, with Horasis. Let me uh, offer my deepest thanks to Horasis, to Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter. Um, let you know how honored I am to be uh, with Alexander Malaket, the president of Opia, Opus Advisory Services, and likewise with I'm Dr. Jayanta Potter, the MD and CEO of um, Dekarazi Paints and Coatings. And um, it's just been fascinating to, to be part of the, the process up to today. Um, I'm Raj Bala. Um, I'm a distinguished professor at the University of Kansas Law School, where I teach international trade law, advanced international trade law, Islamic law, and law and literature. Um, and I also hold two other jobs. One is with Denton's. Uh, the largest law firm in the world. Uh, in our Kansas City office, I work as a senior advisor on trade matters. And uh, finally, um, with Bloomberg, uh, specifically Bloomberg Quint in Mumbai, I write a column called On Point um, on international law and economics. Um, so it's a, just a, a pleasure to and, and quite a blessing to, to wear those three hats and bring them all uh, here uh, today. Um, I, I've been asked to sort of lead off um, our discussion um, with some themes uh, about uh, how we might uh, sub uh, substantially revise um, world trade. Now, uh, of course, all of our planning uh, 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 occurred, or much of it, before the 24th of February uh, when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, from the Ukrainian perspective, this is actually a war that's been going on since 2014 when Russians invaded Crimea. The simple point is revising uh, substantially world trade has become a lot more difficult uh, in the last week. Um, so uh, and I think we're all thinking through what is the world trading system going to look like? And we can talk about the, the, the polar is the further polarization as we go forward. But let me offer a couple of, of, of themes to start us off. Um, I think the prospects for substantially revising world trade are, are difficult for a few reasons. The first is theoretical. Uh, the theory of free trade, that is Adam Smith's absolute advantage, which he writes about in 1776 with the wealth of nations, and David Ricardo's 
law of comparative advantage, which he writes about in 1819 in his book, The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. Those theories are no longer widely accepted among the public in most countries. They are increasingly the confines of blackboards or whiteboards among neoclassical economists, academics. But they're not the, the basic theory which had been so widely adhered, accepted and adhered to in the post Second World War with the birth of GATT um, and onward to the in 1947 and onward to the birth of the WTO in 1995. The basic theory is not subscribed to widely. And a related theory, which comes um, goes as far back to uh, the early uh, Christian church fathers and has its um, um, more recent incarnations with philosophers like Montesquieu and Batistat, and then with President Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, the theory of peace through trade, that peace can be enhanced if countries realize and enhance their own interdependence, that they, they want to be interdependent on one another. Um, and that, as Batistat said, when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. Well, to prevent soldiers crossing, let's have more free trade. That corollary to the Smith-Ricardo um, paradigm also is not believed in anymore, whereas it was with respect to the European Union's foundation. And, and other contexts we can talk about. Um, so the first problem we have to do to substantially revise world trade is, is get back to our, our theory of why we are trading and whether it is beneficial to all of us um, in both an economic and national security sense. Um, the second problem we have, uh, and I think it was done in 2016, the most comprehensive study done on poverty in India, uh, raise this theme. We cannot expect to move forward with trade liberalization when it is demonstrably the case that trade has been at least correlated with increasing income inequality and increasing um, uh, uh, social and political inequalities. Um, We've seen rising uh, measures like ab absolute top bottom ratios and Gini coefficients. Um, and um, with, as, as trade has liberalized between roughly 1994, 95, when NAFTA and the WTO were born, and then across the next 20, 25 years. Um, and we have to deal with that. Um, and, and in the Indian context, it's fascinating because um, I, I've heard it said by Indian commerce uh, uh, ministry officials, we can't credibly negotiate a free trade agreement unless we deal with the poverty alleviation dimensions of what we're negotiating. Um, so we're going to have to deal with that. A third problem I think that is uh, we're going to have to deal with into substantially revised free trade is ethics. Now, um, we've seen this with the Chinese Communist Party and uh, the uh, uh, strong increase in the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and also followed by the Canadian Border Services Agency of putting withhold release orders, or WROs, on forced labor products from Xinjiang. Um, and I think many people, and, I, and here I want to definitely uh, um, a compliment, uh, not that any of us is old, but the younger generation, um, let's say, my students, you know, uh, the, 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 one, the 20-somethings, the 30-somethings, they really don't want to purchase merchandise that, that um, the inputs in which uh, involve human rights or forced labor violations. And they also don't, they also are looking for carbon border tax adjustments. They don't want to purchase dirty goods. So there's an ethics issue. Um, and then we have, um, I think, um, a, a fourth problem we can talk about, um, which is the president himself. Um, uh, President Biden lacks trade negotiating authority. Um, and it's typically been the United States that has been the driver of trade liberalization. Um, 
uh, and it, you see we, you see the the administration struggling to define an Indo-Pacific economic framework that will cobble enough things together like something on digital trade, but will not need congressional approval because the president can't get it. So um, those are just to sketch out, you know, four basic problems. The, the theory of trade, the inequality correlated with trade, the ethics of trade, and then the practicalities of American-led um, trade liberalization, given the lack of um, uh, free, uh, 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 fast track trade authority. So let me stop there and hopefully that catalyzes some, a few things. And thank you again. No, Raj, this is fantastic. Thank you. I've been scribbling madly as you spoke just to keep up because I, I aim to learn from these sessions as well. So I appreciate that, that starting point. Um, I'll just take a second, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce myself, which I didn't do and I should have at the beginning. Uh, my name is Alexander Malaket, and I'm, in short, I consult in various aspects of international trade with a focus on trade financing and risk mitigation, and then some element of trade-related international development, and more recently, the whole sustainable trade and sustainable trade-related financing piece. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, and I've, Raj, I picked up on a number of points in terms of your sketching of these four problems. And we can, you know, turn it over to Janet in just a second. But I just want to bring, I guess, a hint of the positive aspects of the solutioning yeah. of some of those problems that we're starting to see, right? So um, I think your point is well taken about the theoretical uh, framework on which trade is built. Um, and I suspect that one of the reasons that the general populace doesn't believe those theoretical constructs that much anymore is because we, and I'll say we as trade practitioners, haven't necessarily done a good job telling the story of trade in a positive way, right? So we've been in very much on the back foot, very much in defensive mode. Um, we probably should have acknowledged earlier on the inequities and imperfections in the world trade architecture and the way this functions. But some of the, you know, job loss realities and so on that are attributed to trade, we know are partly really belong with technology evolution. So it's not a trade dynamic, it's more of a tech issue, and it's more about reskilling and upskilling than reducing trade flows. So there are these bits. In terms of the ethical components, you know, the whole uh, traceability of supply chains, the digital trade, all of these areas, happily, we're seeing some very significant progress, particularly post the beginning of the COVID crisis, but also tracing back to post-2008 at the peak of that crisis. So I think there's some positive elements to be shared about the use, the, the thinking around sustainable trade and sustainable trade practices, visibility across supply chains, um, the whole business about progressive trade agreements, which Canada and Europe have been leading quite significantly in terms of how we approach those discussions with CETA and with um, yeah. CPTPP, among others. So I think there is some real potential in, pro in advancing these progressive trade agreements to include solving some of the problems that you've sketched out for us, Raj. Janta, can I turn it over to you from a commercial perspective and given what you've sketched for us as far as your commercial experience? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks. And uh, Raj has uh, a very, very uh, interesting uh, perspective, very nice perspective what you have given. Now, I would like to add, uh, you know, before getting into the commercial uh, aspects of that, that, as you rightly said, the various aspects of trade. Now, uh, I would like to point out a few more things that, you know, what are the reasons for trade? The, you know, there are a few, few, few main reasons, you know, why the trade is happening between, uh, between the countries. So one would be the one, as uh, Alexander said, that difference in technology. One of the major reasons for trade is difference in technology. Second difference would be the resource endowment. There is a difference in resource endowment. Third would be the difference in demand right the demand supply gap you know i am having excess uh, product you don't you want that so there is a trade right fourth would be which is now become uh, very very important that government policies that existence of government policies so, you know depending on that the trade happens which is definitely we are going to elaborate on that you know in in, in greater details right so uh, and and obviously another another factor is the service factor, right? The, that that's become the most important factor nowadays. If you look at the uh, you know the merchandise and the service, the service trade is uh, the growth of service sector is much more than the merchandise uh, you know sector. So these are the uh, few uh, reasons of trade across the globe, and and all uh, uh, international trades falls 
either or you know some one of this of these points either they fall one points or more than one points or something like that now coming to the commercialization of these things what are the what are the what are the figures says now uh, if we look at the international trade uh, for the last let's say 20 25 years let's say last quarter century i am not going back to 50 years 100 years that not relevant actually so if you look at last 20 25 years let's say if we look at 1995 25 years so between 1995 and 2001 if you look at if you follow the international trade there is a strong growth between 2002 to 2008 there is a boom the it's further that's become a boom international trade boom now 2008 to 2010 then there is a recession as an absolute very deep recession after 2010 means 2011 12 that again the trade trying to rebound means growth again started coming in 2011 2012 2013 again from 2013 14 onwards though there are growth i am not saying there are not no growth but very weak the growth are very very weak it's not happening what it should be right now if you look at the figure if you look at the figure there are in the in the, uh, 2014 onwards there are uh, you know the the wall merchandise export has uh, overall gone up by 14% and service export has gone up by 22% so there are there are there are growth it's not that we are not growing but we are not growing what we should be the 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 way the potential we are not fulfilling the potential and that is why the company the the, the countries are suffering now if you look at that uh, reason behind that 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 uh, you know what are the reason behind uh, that boom period why that boom has happened in 2000 uh, to 2008 or between 1995 to 2001 why there is a very strong growth or why currently there is no growth or very limited growth you can see for example one could be the uh, you know euro introduction of euro in 2002 that euro coins and 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 uh, the euro introduction makes a very very positive uh, impact on the on on international trade right and 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 there are and between 95 to 2001 there are lot of important events took place for example that mexico's monetary crisis then the dot com bust happened during that time asian uh, economy uh, got in a recession in 1997 right and between 2002 and 2008 the the reason of boom is mainly due to the huge chinese demand for natural resources because everybody started taking product from china there is a huge demand of product in China, and that becomes a very boom in international trade. Right. So, so these are the things happened in the last uh, decade, in the between 95 and 2012, 2000, uh, uh, you know, 14. After that, now the protectionism has come in. Donald Trump's America first policy came in. Now, a lot of kinds of these policies came in and, and that's why there are break in international trade. A lot of things happen between countries that we will definitely going to discuss in, 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 in their part. But if you, as Alexander said, the commercial aspects of the trade, it's growing, but the growth is limited. The countries are not getting the full benefit of international trade. Trade barriers are again coming back. What that has been, you know, you know, abolished few years back, again, those are coming back because of simple policy of protectionism, right? So that's why the new trade policies are being formed now. For example, CPTPP is now become the new things that America has done with Mexico and Canada. Now, RCEP has been uh, introduced among the 16 countries in Asia, right? Then U European Union and Japan has come to an agreement of a free trade. So all this is happening, uh, you know, newly. Uh, the other countries, other than other than US, are looking for various opportunities uh, for international trades. They are trying to remove the tariff barriers. In in one hand, uh, you know, few countries are putting tariff barriers. On the other hand, few countries are trying to, you know, remove the tariff barriers and other non-tariff barriers. 
so that we will discuss in uh, in, a, uh, in the later part but these are the basic commercialization of international trade for the last 20 25 years arjun janta thank you for that another rich intervention and raj i admire your restraint i can feel you wanting to jump in on a number of these points and you've you've restrained uh, you restrained yourself um let me pick up on a couple of points janta from from your observations and i think uh, it, it really was helpful for me certainly for you to sketch out the timeline and sort of some of the key developments across that timeline i think there's some really notable uh, elements of this um I guess one of the things I wanted to explore with the two of you. So the way the question was phrased for our panel was around comparing current state to: Are we looking at a future Great Depression that's trade related? And I, I wanted to maybe take a moment to make the point that certainly pre two thousand eight international trade for the fifty years before that. I take your point, Jayant, about the relevance of the timeline, but just to make the point for the fifty years before that. trade was actually a driver of economic growth and and of prosperity it was leading gdp growth globally and all those kinds of things so trade was a net contributor to all of those kind of up upward trending uh, figures if you will and certainly post 2008 you saw very quickly how export trade in particular was dropping very quickly below the gdp global gdp sort of trend line and it's had a a very difficult time t- retaking its position as a as a as a leading Uh, or a driving engine of of GDP growth, um, we saw some of that come back as you mentioned in the mid sort of twenty twenty twelve twenty thirteen timeframe, and, and we're seeing a little bit of of reversal of that now again, um, driven partly by COVID, driven by the lockdowns, the impact on SMEs who are critical to the su- global supply chains that we're we're all looking at, and then now we have you know national security considerations, some of them legitimate and some of them less so. I will tell you candidly. nobody on the planet has ever called canada a national security risk it happened recently from one very important ally of ours um but from a trade perspective these are some of the realities that we are looking at right the geopolitics are entering into it the china plus one strategy certainly has been a key part of the conversation in terms of concentration risk in terms of national sourcing but also in terms of supplier concentration risk so there's a lot to unpack in terms of the way business leaders as well as policy makers need to look at trade going forward right the, all of these things are coming together and then when you overlay raj to your point about the ethical conduct of trade the whole what i would call the esg sustainability dimension of all of this you know it adds huge complexity but also tremendous opportunity so with that sort of um, stage setting for the next part of the conversation maybe raj i could turn it back over to you to either expand or take us in some other directions whatever sort of inspires you to do Sure, uh, happy to do so and 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 thank you both uh, so much for for these comments. Um so starting on the kind of topic of of depression. Um it con- there is no um widely accepted uh mathematical definition in the economics profession of what a depression is. Uh, a recession is two successive quarters in a fall in gross domestic product. But when it comes to a depression, um economists generally would point to um loosely um something like a 20% fall in gdp and 20% fall in 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 uh employment um and and maybe corresponding in trade now do i you know not as as a professional lawyer not not as as a former economist do i see a depression in world trade I would say yes and no. The the yes part is in very isolated regions um or in regions that have tremendous political problems and and I'll cite two. Uh, the first is Afghanistan. Um one thing we know and I can say this with some conviction as someone who teaches Islamic law is um Islamist extremists are horrific economists. They run their economies into the ground. that's what's happening in the Taliban that's what happened in Egypt under the Muslim Brotherhood that's what's that what happened with ISIS controlled areas so there if statistics were reliable i bet you would see 20% plus falls um uh, but those are relatively isolated contained areas um the second air, potential pr- areas that can happen is areas that are beset with you know political or war risk and that would include 
not only North Korea, but um, uh, now uh, Russia. Um, uh, thanks to President Putin's economic policies, China, uh, Russia has now fallen behind China as a middle income country. Um, and his economy is not set up to maximize GDP growth. It's set up to um, uh, uh, ensconce his political support among his oligarchs. But for the rest of the world, the happy story, um, uh, picking up on, on comments you were making earlier about, you know, what's the positive side? Um, there, there is a um, coalition, if you will, of like minded countries that are determined one way or another. Um, not to go through um, what exactly uh, so well pointed out by Dr. Chianta, the, 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 the declines we saw, the recessionary declines we saw um, after the GFC and, af- and with COVID. Um, and how they do that, whether it's through internal fiscal stimulus, um, Keynesian style policies, which in effect has been going on in both the Trump and Biden administrations, um, or it's through some kind of enhanced trade agreements, as you quite rightly pointed out, Alexander, with CETA and, and other um, uh, uh, major trade agreements that Canada signed. That that will depend on, 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 on country to country. But I do see um, some hope there. And then uh, also I like what Dr. Um, Janta said about disaggregating the statistics and looking at services growth. Um, that's an important thing because, you know, we, we look at manufacturer trade and then we can disaggregate from ag and, and agriculture and industry. We always know there are going to be some sensitive sectors in agriculture, uh, Canada and dairy, obviously, U.S. and sugar. Um, uh, much of the, the Indian agricultural sector, given the failure of the farm reforms. Um, but in other areas, we can see more robust um, uh, trade growth. Or we can expect that. Um, let me conclude with, with the, the my answer with one point because we talked about national security and, and you're right. I mean, invoking section 232 against Canada was laughable. Um, 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 the, the drag on trade recovering and, and not falling into recession, much less depression. Um, part of it is the proliferation of the use of conventional trade remedies, anti-dumping, countervailing duties, safeguards, plus, as you mentioned, the, 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 re, the use of national security to justify um, uh, restricting imports. Um, now, if you, if you added up the percentage of world trade that's actually affected by AD, CVD, safeguards, Section 232, not that great. Um, Probably greater with Section 301 and the China trade war, which we definitely will probably want to talk about. But the overall effect and the impression on leading entrepreneurs of the expansion and, of, and proliferation of trade remedies is that I better secure my supply chain locally or regionally so that I'm not caught up in one of these ADCVD safeguard 232 301 cases. Um, it's, it's, they send a bad signal if we're trying to revise world trade. Um, let me, let me stop with there and hope that that was helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Raj, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just, Janta, before I turn it over to you for your thoughts here is, is maybe throw in a kind of what, what might be a semi-controversial observation. Um, and we, it's, it's difficult to have a conversation on the future of trade without at least mentioning the WTO, right? And there's this huge perception, and I've, I've talked to a number of practitioners and, and folks on the finance side and elsewhere who just think the WTO is a basket case and doesn't work and doesn't function and it needs to be rethought from the ground up. Um, interestingly, Aside the uh, the appellate body, which obviously there's there's a fundamental issue there that that's going to need some, some very significant diplomatic effort if it's ever going to be resolved. Um, some of the anecdotal discussions we've had with people at the WTO in Geneva and people in that orbit suggest that actually the entity as a whole, when it when you go back to to the GATT and look at the mission of the WTO over those pe- that period of time it's actually been relatively effective at reducing non, non-tariff barriers and other barriers to international trade aside the, the, the dispute resolution mechanisms, which, which again, are, are, are fundamentally in need of, of adjustment. Um, is the 
architecture for trade as we have it today fit for purpose? And, and you know, picking up on your point, Raj, around some of the positive elements or some of the less negative elements, it, it's clear that you can look around and say, look at what's happening, for example, in the ASEAN. There are economies in the world who have come together and are taking some interesting steps forward in advancing regional trade, partly as an offset to geopolitical pressures and tensions, partly as a counterbalance to, to emerging power from China and elsewhere. Um, so there are models, apparently, where we can advance these things in a constru- constructive way. And as a Canadian, I cite, again, Canada, EU with the CETA thing and, and, and so on. Um, can, can, what are your thoughts on the architecture for trade and how well it's working? Maybe, Giant, I can, I can start with you on that one. And if you wanted to, again, weave in some of the other elements that we talked ahead, about ahead of the panel, then turn, turn that question back over to you, Raj, in terms of the fit for purposeness or suitability of the architecture as it is. Yeah? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, you know, uh, as uh, come back to the that your main questions, uh, you know, that is the, you know, whether we are looking for another, uh, you know, depression or not. That is, I would like to point out one or two points which, uh, you know, Raj has, uh, you know, expressed everything. Uh, practically from, absolutely from, a, as a practitioner point of view, uh, my uh, take is uh, that uh, I don't think there will be any depression. Uh, uh, it can only happen if the, if the countries and the big organization they cannot manage the supply chain, the the new supply chain. It's all depends on how well we can manage the new supply chain. Because, you know, people may say that because of COVID, that we may come into the depression. One, nothing is uh, related to international trade. Because of COVID, we may come into depression. It is not going to happen. Because what happened in 1920s after Spanish flu, people say that because of that uh, pandemic, the depression come, Today, we are 100 years ahead. So, And there are a uh, lot of economic body in all, all countries and internationally. They take care of everything. If anything goes wrong, they you know increase the interest rate, decrease the interest rate economically. And Raj, you are an economist. You know, you know much better than that. So somehow they manage that. You know, But if we cannot handle the supply chain, the new supply chain, what has happened post-pandemic or during pandemic or because of this, uh, you know, the fracture... Uh, international trade then there could be a depression but i don't think that has happened there could be sporadic uh, you know uh, kind of 2008 kind of a situation but in general depression i don't think that is uh, you know going to come uh, in, in 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 near future let's hope let's you know keep our finger crossed see point number 1 now coming back to uh, you know alexander now, as you say, you know, my uh, take is that uh, there are few points, few things which will shape uh, whatever happened, whatever is happening, that's one side. But what is going to happen, you know, if you ask me that which are the points, which are the things which we are going to shape the international trade, as, as you want to know. Now, there are few few trends which, are, which I, can, I can see right now. One is that government seeking more control over critical uh, supplies. Each and every government wants to seek more control over critical supplies. That's going to one one of the very important trend coming in, you know, going forward. Second point will be that reducing risk through diversification of supply chain, which is going to be the very, very big factor. The, the handling of supply chain, the diversification of supply chain, as Alexander, you say, China plus one strategy. Now, when you say China plus one strategy, now I can share my own experience for the last 30 years. You know, when I started my career 30 years back, so there, in India, there is a very popular term called China sourcing. You know, we used to call China sourcing. What does it mean? That you source from China. Don't look at anywhere else. Look at China only. Why look at China only? Only because of price. Nothing else. Let me tell you, we faced huge problems so far as quality is concerned. We struggled for five years to standardize China product in India, chemicals and all other things. But still, we were with China only because of price. But today, the situation is different. As I understand, China is no longer a cheaper source. The cost of China, production cost of China has gone up for the last few years. It's nothing to do with America first policy of Donald Trump. 
China cost has gone up before Donald Trump's America first policy. People look at beyond China before Donald Trump, not after Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump and all the other things has, this is a basically fuel to the fire. This is fuel to the fire that has escalated the China plus one strategy. So this supply chain, China plus one or whatever you say, that's become a main one of the biggest factor of future you know, international trade. Number three is the everybody, most of the industry is going towards the digitization. Now, digitization is the key word today, right? If you look at India, US or the thing, all, you know, now we are going to most of the industries with D2C, direct to consumer. And direct to consumer, when you say it's basically digitization, right? In case of B2B, in case of supply chain, people are seeking for a visibility. Entire visibility starting from when you are placing the order and when you receive the order. Entire visibility in the supply chain, which is a big challenge, right? He, this is going to you know shape the future international trade. Certainly, next point would be geopolitical pressure. It's always there and it is going to be further escalated. Geopolitical pressure in this, you know, the current situation, Ukraine situation, and obviously the China situation is there. And the last but not the, not the least, one of the most important factor which is going to shape international trade going forward is ESG sustainability. What already uh, Alexander has mentioned, that is going to be one of the biggest factors, biggest talking point of international trade, how it is going to shape. Now, if you are now looking at ESG sustainability, if you look at the Asian countries, ESG sustainability, that, that is not there right now, except for in you know, a couple of few uh, in, in the companies. So for US and Europe or the developed countries, their responsibility, I think, would be to teach the Asian countries or the underdeveloped countries or developing countries that how important ESG sustainability is and how it is going to shape the future international trade. If we are not ESG sustainable, we are not going to take part of international trade. However, we are having the various kind of treaty, right? So yeah. these are the five, six points what Alexander asked me. These are the few important uh, you know, uh, things I can see that which are going to, uh, you know, shape international trends going forward. Genta, thank you very much. And I, I won't sort of replay all of this. There's a lot of richness in what you've unpacked for us here. Very much agree with you on the digitization piece. That's very transformative. And we saw from a practitioner's perspective, post COVID, we think digitization has been accelerated probably five years just in our attempt to respond to the COVID reality. So we think there's some real progress there. On the ESG piece, again, I think we need to start by acknowledging the imperfections in the in the reality that we face. So when you think that in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, the global shipping industry sits somewhere between Canada and Japan in terms of the amount of emissions that it, it creates, uh, you know, that's a huge issue. And we need to be thinking about those kinds of things. Supply chain traceability aided by technological capabilities to help us do that. There's some real progress there, some real promise. Um, I guess given that we've got about six or seven minutes, Raj, maybe um, the question about the fit for purposeness of the architecture, plus any trends that you wanted to highlight going forward and, and a kind of a concluding set of remarks around the panel would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I definitely want to address the fit for purpose. Just to circle back on one quick point that, that, that you both uh, very astutely mentioned, the China plus one strategy, there's also a legal reason for that. The, 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 communi the Chinese Communist Party's national security law for itself and for Hong Kong, as well as its anti-foreign sanctions law, um, basically put companies in what we lawyers call a conflict of laws position, that if a company operating in China complies with, say, U.S. sanctions, um, the, the, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, then it violates Chinese law, but also vice versa. If it complies with Chinese law, it violates a U.S. law. And that is a major stimulant to uh, decouple your supply chain from China or do the plus one. Now, turning to the fit for purpose, I would say, you know, the, the problem is not so much whether or not the WTO is structurally fit for purpose. The problem is that the attitude 
of many of the 164 members, including very much the United States, is not fit for purpose. And let me explain that. The WTO has three basic functions. It's a negotiating forum. It is, uh, provides research and statistics um, and studies, and it is a dispute settlement mechanism. Now, take the middle one. Research and statistics is not something that is essential um, that we've got to have a WTO to do that because, as we all know, investment banks, commercial, commercial banks, universities, um, NGOs, governments produce lots of research and statistics. So that's really not a problem, attitudinally or structurally. Um, the, 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 the first problem, the problems come in, in numbers one or th and three. On the negotiating forum, the WTO, aside from the uh, 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 trade facilitation agreement and uh, the, the medicines agreement um, and a little bit of work on vaccinations, has produced no multilateral agreement since the 1986 to 1994 Uruguay round. And the Doha round collapsed. Why? Because it, that round and all subsequent efforts to develop a multilateral agreement on anything have collapsed into commercial self-interest, um, where each country preaches free trade, but behaves in a mercantilist or mercantilist way, um, protecting its own industries to mac and then maximize exports, and has failed to see the common good that's at stake, whether that common good is poverty alleviation, whether that common good is developing a multilateral agreement on fishing subsidies, which would benefit millions of people and their diets around the world, um, whether that common good is an environmental um, uh, goods agreement. The, the, the countries can't see past themselves. Um, and, and it goes back to a point that you made, Alexander, earlier that we lawyers, and our political leaders have failed to make the case for trade liberalization. Um, now, on the third function, dispute settlement mechanism, here I would say, again, the problem is attitudinal or ideological. If you look at the core reason why the appellate body is dead, why, why it died in December of 2019, the core reason, in my humble judgment, is the relentless attacks by the United States on the appellate body following a string of losses in zeroing cases and in cases involving countervailing duties and how do you identify a government agency. Um, and the core or the gist of the American attack on the appellate body was that the appellate body was judicially active. Well, why was it judicially active? The Americans say the appellate body members strayed beyond the four corners of a text, the legal text they were, the treaties they were interpreting, and made up stuff. Now, that reflects an American ideo ideology, which is unique to the United States. You will not see that in India or Canada. Uh, uh, they, uh, and it's a, that philosophy or ideology is called textualism, that a judge, like a robot, must simply look at the text and never stray beyond it and look at a dictionary to define ambiguous terms. Well, I've talked to Supreme Court justices in, in multiple countries. They're not, they're, they do not rigidly adhere to textualist, the textualism. They know that you have to sometimes look at the context um, of, a, of an agreement, a treaty. You sometimes have to look at pragmatic concerns um, uh, uh, surrounding that agreement. But basically what the Americans have done is tried, they have exported their peculiar, narrow judicial ideology um, and uh, to the WTO. And, and the rest of the world has said, wait a second, that's not how our judges think. That's not how we view treaty interpretation. Um, so that's why I say it's an, it's an attitudinal problem, not a, not a structural problem. Um, uh, to conclude, because I can see we've pretty much run out of time, um, I, I share with both of you, um, despite the problems I've identified, a, a sense of optimism. Um, I think that the, the, uh, the, 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 the U.S., the, uh, most of the Indo-Pacific region, uh, the U.S. allies, Canada, of course, the European Union, we, we all know our history. 
um, after the first and second world wars. And nobody wants to repeat that. And if we can just get the right um, leaders, um, states, women, as well as states, men uh, in place to, to, to take us um, out of the kind of hole we're in now um, and, and do so for our, our kids, um, I'm, I'm optimistic that we will see trade uh, substantially uh, revitalized. Thank you, Raj. That was that was a lot of depth on the WTO. Thank you for that uh, real education for me as well. Um, curiously, we are out of time, but we there was a, a message saying we can stay as long as we want. So happily, that gives us a chance to do a nice clean wrap up. Um, so I'll thank you for your conclusion on this, Raj. Thank you for your time today. And Jayanta, I'll just ask you for a final thought in terms of the overall theme. Where do you where do you land? And I'll wrap up with one or two observations of my own, and we'll we'll call it uh, we'll call it a wrap. Over to you, Jayanta. Okay. Okay, since we are on the Horace's U.S. meeting, so from U.S. point of view, my thinking is the biggest question, so far as international trade is concerned, the biggest questions would be, should we rethink China's strategy? Should U.S. rethink China's strategy? If you ask me, I would say no. Why no? Because already U.S. has started something against or whatever China, and they have taken you know, measures against that. Some of the company has shifted their production. Some of the company is going to shift their production or that China plus one strategy there, they are, they are doing it. And recent past, if you look at, uh, look at it, October, November, December last year, even January, February, there is a huge power shortage in China. And there are total disruption of various goods coming out of China. And then there are container shortages, right? Export shortages, container, the, the rate is going through the roof. Now, people by this time, to a large extent, I'm not saying that everybody is ready with the new supply chain. I'm not saying that. But people have started moving that direction to China plus one strategy. If not plus one strategy or if not other than China strategy. And that is, is happening. You need to give some time. It is not something which has happened overnight. Right. But because but this is a very long term, long drawn implications. So what is a long drawn in implication? You must give must have some patience, must give some time. And since this is a time is a pandemic time, your, uh, you know, uh, uh, product demand and service demand is also in a lower side. So you can take that advantage in your stride and build up a parallel or new supply chain facility other than China what you are already doing it for the last two, three, four years and make it possible in next two, three, four years for a long term, it will be a better proposition for US. That is my understanding. So I would say that whatever is there, okay, fine. But that doesn't mean that America first is a, is a, is a difficult thing. That's a separate uh, you know, policy altogether, right? That America, US need to, need to look into, right? But other than this, so for a supply chain, international trade, which is hugely depend on China, we should be come out of that. Not only US, for everybody. That is my take. Okay, Janta, thank you for that. I, I think I'll take it just up a level in terms of the trade discussion rather than get into specific geographic discussions because I think we've covered them enough other than to say, picking up on your point, Raj, in terms of Russia, Ukraine, now that's going to have some implications for commodity trade, for for natural resources, all kinds of things with, with the pipeline into Europe being shut down now. Um, there are going to be some, some implications for, for all of this going forward. Uh, but in terms of our overall question, I like to think that um, the positive optimistic side of our conversation will prevail, that people will understand the value and the importance of trade, both in terms of value creation, poverty reduction, all of the positive elements, but also, frankly, as a tool of geopolitical influence, which we're seeing it used as we speak in, in, in the days that we're living today. Um, so it's an extremely um, strategically important part of the human experience. And I think to your point also, Raj, the right leadership needs to be there to start to take things in the right direction, whatever that ends up being sort of uh, for us collectively. Um, so I think we're all in agreement that there isn't necessarily a depression coming, that there's some real uh, signs and signals for optimism in terms of the evolution of trade, including the, the enabling technologies, the ideally the enabling policy environments and triggers that we might choose to pursue. Um, so I think we'll end the panel on a positive note. 
and thank you to all of those those of you of the Harassus community, community who joined us and who will watch this as a recorded panel later on. And gentlemen, Jayanta, uh, Raj, both of you, thank you very much for joining. It's been a pleasure sharing the uh, podium with you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you so much. Thanks, Raj. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye for now.